I was discussing with my good friend Sri Krishna. Uh, so we'll try and uh, make it as engaging as possible and hopefully in the process also share some nuggets of wisdom. Uh, on the panel uh, with me, I'm very delighted to have Bruce Campbell, who's the principal and founder of Campbell Law Group and uh, our partner in the US. Uh, and uh, we have Subhas Parega, who's a Mumbai-based partner of the law firm and back of ventures. Uh, just a quick disclaimer, all three of us are corporate lawyers. All three of us work with a cross-section of startups. Uh, whether they're social or anti-social, we don't discriminate. Uh, we work with social business enterprises. We work with non-profit organizations, impact investors and venture philanthropists across the world. Uh, the idea is to provide not only legal advice, but legal advice which is balanced with principles of business prudence and pragmatism. Because uh, we fundamentally realize that's a need of the sector. So we constitute what we like to believe and are often told crucial ecosystem service providers for the sector and hence our presence at the conference. Uh, the background of the session primarily uh, stems from the fact that we realize that Sankar usually sees uh, quite a heavy influx of entrepreneurs who set up their business are in need for reason investment capital to grow their business and scale their business. And the reason we thought it might be worthwhile having this conversation, the dialogue based conversation with you, is to share some of the insights that we've seen uh, on the basis of our extensive deal experience. I think between three of us, we've done close to over 200 investment deals in the last two years. Uh, and a significant portion of them is in the sector itself. Uh, so, a couple of session rules which I want to uh, uh, share with you. Uh, hopefully, we'll try and make this a in the session. So, at any point of time, either of us end up being a bit targeted, please raise your hand and say, I don't understand. The so, idea is to not uh, have a democratized access to knowledge. Uh, we also are uh, fond believers of having a dialogue with us at any point of time, just raise your hand if you want to shoot a question because we also believe that peer learning is very powerful. Uh, questions in real time, please. Uh, and before we formally kick off the session, can we have a quick show of hands about how many entrepreneurs are in the room? Excellent. How many of you are social entrepreneurs? Okay. How many of you are non-profit organizations? Looking to take a for-profit entrepreneur? Okay, excellent. How many of you are representing the investor side? So all the entrepreneurs in the audience, please take the business cards at the end of the session, along with the lawyer's business cards, because that would come in handy, especially post the session. So great, so we are going to kick off. So the, uh, as you would have said, sure. Is anyone raising money from non-Indian investors? How many of you are looking to raise? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're the exotic element of the So, uh, how many of you are looking to raise capital from non investment investors? Which is uh, all the relevant folks because India historically has been a capital deficit and especially the impact of investment space, what we see is that a predominant proportion of capital which comes is from sources outside India. And most of the investors that we have seen at the sidelines of this conference constitute and represent foreign capital. So what news will also bring on the panel is a very clear uh, perspective on what are the things that foreign investors look for. So there is always a cultural nuance in terms of raising investment capital from Indian investors versus foreign investors. And of course there are legal implications as well that we hope to discuss over the course of the next couple of minutes. Any questions for news for us? 40 minutes. <laughs> Excellent. So, uh, the headline of our session is raising investment capital. And uh, uh, I, I think let's address the single biggest elephant in the room what is investment, right? Because uh, we personally do realize that it's the money which makes the world go around and social impact will only follow when you've got the money, right? So, uh, let me start off with you, Bruce, in terms of what is uh, your perception about raising investment and how do you perceive? Uh, entrepreneurs and what has been your experience about entrepreneurs raising investment? I think I think it's important first for an entrepreneur to think critically about about why an entrepreneur wants to raise money and thinking because there are some benefits and there's also some potential drawbacks from raising money from from outside investors. And so I think it's important to go into the relationship eyes eyes wide open. And it is a relationship. I mean you're you know, I, I would think of uh, this as starting a partnership. Um, and by the way, so not only 
know, I counsel startups, but I, I just recently founded my own startup and we successfully raised about three quarters of a billion dollars in, in the U.S. And so I've kind of seen this from both the inside and you know, from the outside. But um, so I think it's again important to go in the relationship with eyes wide open, and I think really understand what can be good about the investors you're working with. I see a lot of uh, some folks here from like, Gray Matter uh, Capital and, and some of the other uh, businesses that have spawned from a guy named Bob Utillo, who's a pioneer in both microfinance and investment. And Bob talks about his philosophy. He, he uses this analogy of uh, an entrepreneur is, is on his journey and he's growing a, a canoe. Um, and he's having a difficult journey, he thinks he needs help. And he sees some people on the shore of the river that might be able to help him in his journey. And, uh, you know, and Bob says, you know, I'm the kind of entrepreneur that, I mean, the kind of investor that I want to get into that canoe. And I want to pick up a row. And I'm going to, I'm going to row that canoe just as far as the entrepreneur. And I'm going to get palaces on my hands. I'm going to break a sweat. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to, to make this, this investment successful. So, and, he, and he's also you know, has the knowledge that can help you root finding. How do you, there's a fork in the river, which way do you go? Do you go left or do you go right to know some of the danger areas? You know, as opposed to an investor that just gets in the canoe and just sits back and says, okay, let's go. It just really becomes dead weight, right? Um, sure, maybe they're paying you some money for the journey, but how are they really helping you to get, get to the destination? And so, um, so I think it's really, it's also important understanding when you're starting this relationship. Uh, think about what comes in addition to the money, right? The expertise, the connections. Um, but also know that you're in this relationship, and if you're in this relationship at the end, you know, if there's if a divorce, if someone is, is getting thrown out of the canoe, it's often the entrepreneur that gets thrown out of the canoe rather than the investor. And so, I've seen this multiple times. In my career was recently where a founder started a company, raised capital, but it didn't end up being really good chemistry uh, when the investor comes to the bar. The business wasn't really going well as expected. And, and the entrepreneur lost his post as the manager of the CEO. And now the investor is the same. So be smart. So I think Bruce raised a very series of important points, and I love the two examples. Uh, funnily enough, the example which I like using about raising investment is that it's a marriage of the pre and pre stage. Uh, simply because the investor is very eager about their exit. Right? It's not a uh, relationship in perpetuity. So, you yeah. didn't use marriage because you're so rich, there isn't any place. There you go. That's what it was. So, so uh, just on that point, I'm carrying forward as well as I'm going to come to you. So, typically, once you raise the investment, what are the typical implications of having raised investment at a high level, right? What is it that uh, in the matter of the causes among the audience in the shoes of entrepreneurs? What is it that they should bear in mind? Is it just taking uh, money with no expectations attached? What are the strings attached to being in a partnership or a marriage uh, with the investor? Yeah, I, I, think, I think we should take it from where Bruce uh, left off. Because, uh, there are different perspectives from the entrepreneur side and what you do. Uh, uh, not only running your business but managing uh, uh, 
subsequent investment. So I think that is from the top. That is one of the things from the top. Apart from that, of course, there's the day-to-day -day, uh, aspect, which is how uh, how you uh, how you have you know what kind of expectations have been set between you and the investor, and it's very very important that you uh, set those expectations at the beginning, and uh, the investor sets those expectations at the beginning as well, uh, and then it plays out the way uh, you like to play. Yeah, I, I, I think that's an excellent point that I just come back to you. So about expectation management. So the reason why expectation management is very important and it is not to be underestimated is we've seen entrepreneurs who just sign on the dotted line of the shareholders agreement that the investor throws their way without even understanding the DNA of the investor, without understanding where the investor is coming from or understanding what is expected of the entrepreneur by the investor, which trust me results in a lot of uh, gross mismatch of expectations. So I think a stellar point which Suhas ended up taking on is expectation management. In terms of understanding what the investment is about, it's not only... But in, you know, in the kind of impact world, that may not necessarily be true. But, but you will find, you'll find some investors in the impact world to say, it's important that I have commercial returns, or more commercial returns, or more wealth investments than commercial returns. Others are less concerned, others are more motivated by, kind of, by the impact that they can. So I think it's important to be very clear up front in terms of are you seeing eye to eye as far as what is the most important goals of the organization. Is it the most important goal to maximize profit in return or is it, is, is it kind of like driving motivation or concern with the wall to have some, some sort of positive social benefit? Just, just to take off on that, uh, one of the questions that I very commonly encountered in the last few days is uh, what if three years down the line I would build my business and I think selling <coughs> selling the product that we're selling it at a higher price to work for my business. And for the entrepreneur's sake, his business surviving is the biggest, it's the most important aspiration. And that may not be for the investor. That may not be for the investor. And that is very important to set up. How does he look at these situations where maybe the business that he had invested in is no longer the business? And being an entrepreneurial journey, even uh, discounting the social factor is very hard enough, right? Uh, trying to build a startup business itself is already hard, and building a social business with triple bottom lines or double bottom lines or whatever the latest, latest genre, which is doing the rounds on the circuit of this conference about bottom line assessment and measurement, one has to be very, very tactical in terms of making sure that there is perfect alignment of intent about what is counted as social and the fact that you have entrepreneurs you choose to pivot around, uh, the uh, investors find with it. And we come to uh, more on that aspect. Uh, so as uh, in your experience, uh, considering the fact what I referred to earlier about a predominant proportion of capital coming in from foreign sources, how is it that the Indian laws look at foreign capital, which the uh, entrepreneurs in the audience should be aware of? Uh, before engaging in that kind of a conversation with the investor. See, one of the, uh, well, uh, it's, it's unfortunate in a way. Uh, the foreign exchange regulations in India are uh, favor, favor a local investor in terms of uh, uh, providing flexibility in terms of structuring things. Uh, we see that a lot of uh, domestic investments have uh, uh, redemption, options for redemption, where no, it may be treated as a debt and then uh, uh, the investment may be treated as equity at the investor's option. So uh, these are options that are not available to foreign investors. <coughs> you can have uh, uh, preference shares and have, we have a certain way in which we determine the version price. There's some, some upside structure for investors in the company as well. But, but largely uh, here we're talking about equity and we say investment. That is still complicated from a foreign exchange perspective. So the discussions that we have when we're talking about investment for investors is largely a good That's going to raise my hand for some jargon then. Do you see what I agree that's something like that? You know, I, maybe we can just some of those concepts like, you know, redemption or all that. I mean, maybe everyone knows. Maybe not. But How many of you agree with who's that was jargon? Excellent. Bruce, you are a big tactic. Well, well, no. Sorry. But we can do more of that when we get into some of the, the documentation. But I, I mean, I think, you know, just the simplified version is it's, it's, it is a harder conversation with, with foreign investors because there 
there are there are more restrictions, um, which is unfortunate. It also you know tends to increase the transaction costs as well because there's more work for the lawyers. Yeah, and you know, there's a very good reason that India ranks at uh, 132 out of 185 countries of the world ranks easily in business index. And I joke, I like to be good in practice. Fortunately and unfortunately, it's a nightmare to do business in India. Unfortunately for the entrepreneur, fortunately for the lawyers, right? <laughs> uh, but on that note, let me quickly shift gears in the conversation and talk more about what are the key considerations to be uh, kept in mind before you embark on the fundraising process. And I'm going to throw that question out to the panelists, followed by the question that what are the actual steps to be kept in mind while the fundraising process and what happens after that. So that's giving you a brief snapshot. So let's take a couple of minutes here to talk and use a topic of your aim. What are some of the key insights or observations that you'd like to share uh, with the entrepreneurs and the audience, being a corporate lawyer who works at the intersection of these sectors that I mentioned earlier, as well as being an entrepreneur yourself who's fundraised? So I think one, you have to you have, to have a plan. Um, you have to have a plan and a business model, and the plan has to show some sense of you know how to uh, execute and, and grow this business, given the, the capital or given the opportunity. And that's both in terms of the financial growth and in terms of the social impact. So again, if you consider yourself a social enterprise, being able to demonstrate, I have, I have a plan, a real plan to kind of scale my business and, and therefore increase my impact. Whichever entrepreneur has the fanciest PowerPoint and the fanciest Microsoft Excel sheet for the best to get the funding. How many, uh, how many of you agree with the audience with me? Any of you who pitched to the audience, uh, investors ever and have had that kind of feedback or experience? No, so I think that's true. I mean, you know, and I think, you know, at least in the US, the question now is, is not to show necessarily a business plan to the investor. You might just have some sort of plan that you can slides on it. But the point is you have to be able to answer those kinds of questions. And if, and if it's asked, you need to. So you don't want to end up in a conversation where the investor says, okay, you're, you're telling me you're going to have, you know, you're going to be touching 10,000 lives in two years. And then you want to be able to answer the question of how you get there, right? Um, so, so again, I mean, just making sure when I say plan, maybe this is, you know, just, this is something that's internal in your own mind, making sure you've thought through this, you know? So if you say, I'm going to raise $200,000, you know, I can both show how that financial growth happens, how that money is used, and I can also talk about how the, the social impact increases. So, so that's one, how do you, you know, making sure you really understand your business, making sure you understand your plan for growth. Um, the other, I think, important one is, is valuation. This is often the hardest, right? Uh, if I'm going out, this is if I'm asking for equity. If I'm going out and I'm asking for equity investors, how do I figure out you know, what percent of the company they should own and what percent of the company that I should own. And, um, and that's, you know, that's, it's, a, it's very difficult and a lot of different opinions around how to do that. But I, for me, at least the valuation starts from, like, in my gut, what feels fair to me. I, I know the work that I put in, or really, like, in my gut, how much of the company do I have to retain in order to feel like I'm still motivated to work 80 hours a week, right? Or if I think about kind of the ultimate financial return for my business, does my ultimate financial gain feel fair to me based on this valuation? Because without doubt, without having a gut sense of I'm comfortable, this is sort of thinking about the bottom, right? The minimum. You need to know kind of what your bottom line is, right? For you to be able to stay engaged. And this is especially relevant because promoters have an idea of valuation here and investors have an idea of valuation here, yeah. right? And there's a very old investor adage of uh, advice to an entrepreneur, you tell me the valuation, I tell you the terms of the valuation, right? Which is a very, very subtle and a wise saying, simply because when you're looking to raise funding, naturally it's vested interest for the promoter to have as high a valuation as possible, but the investor also has been around the block a couple of times, so they make in a lot of contractual covenants which penalize the entrepreneur if you raise your next round as a down round, for instance. Or, for instance, even making sure that the promoter is actually living up to the terms which are promised to the valuation. And if it's an extraordinarily high valuation, you should make sure to read the fine print of what are the kind of terms and conditions which are attached to the valuation. Right? Yeah, yeah and, and so you, um, right, thinking about the valuation, I'd also say, you know, many terms that you present to an investor, they'll be patient with you and they'll be willing to negotiate them. 
at least in the U.S., it could be different in India because of the cultural context of, of, of negotiation that's kind of a pastime for sport. But um, at least in the U.S., you know, one thing that can really just turn off an investor immediately is if you start with a valuation that's been nowhere within the realm of because it shows the investor that you're just that you're just really too unsophisticated for that, that investment. You just you don't really have a, a grounded sense of, of the opportunity and the possibilities. So I've, I've seen many investors who, you know, they get this out, kind of outrageous valuation and they just walk away. This is always hard for me to share with my clients because, you know, often they'll ask me, what do you think this valuation? I'll say, it's too high. It's not 10 million for a you start. You know, two million. Sometimes they don't call me again. And that's fine, you know. But, but it, you know, valuation is tricky. I think also the valuation is interesting to think about they get thinking about your personal motives for being involved in the business. Is that, you know, how much time do you want to spend raising money? If you're if you're leading with a kind of aggressive valuation, it's going to it's going to take longer. It's going to be more difficult uh, negotiation. Whereas when we, you know, the other approach would be to think, what's really most important to me is I want to get this business started. I want to get it started as soon as possible. I'm not necessarily interested in increasing, you know, maximizing my financial impact. But I'm really passionate about the social impact. And so therefore, as long as I can get what I think is a fair valuation, that's good enough for me, and I want to get the money, and I want to start, start my business. So, so again, I think your motivation is important. And I just want to take on a very important note there. Fundraising actually takes time. And please don't let anyone else tell you otherwise. What have you seen in case of a lot of successful entrepreneurs who raise funding is a philosophy of divide and conquer. Where there is one co-founder who's out of facing fundraising time, and the other guy is the ox guy who's making sure that the ship is sailing all the while that the company is in fundraising mode. Our past experience about working with startup and early stage businesses has led us to believe that on an average it takes six to nine months from the date of starting the conversation to the investor till the date that money actually hits your hand account. So as an entrepreneur, you've got to budget that timeline. We've done deals which have closed in a matter of three days. We've also done deals which have closed in a matter of two and a half years. And the six to nine months is the clearly the uh, average size that we've seen, which falls under the bell curve of our investment experience. Now the lesson in this exercise for entrepreneurs is that at, at any given period of time, the investor that they're cultivating typically is also looking at a lot of other deals. So you've got to compete for that mind space of attention to make sure that your deal is always being pushed ahead by the investor. At another point of time when uh, commercials have been agreed upon and uh, negotiated already, the documentation phase comes with the lawyers get involved and lawyers do also take that time. So promoters always have to be a very efficient sheet anchor in terms of making sure that the ball is always uh, being pushed around and the scoreboard is picking because it will take time to raise funding, which is also precious time being spent away from your business, right? building your business. And as an entrepreneur, spending time uh, running up investor and raising capital may not be the best uh, time devoted to building a business, right? Which is the so I'd like to come to you and listen uh, more about your insights that you share with uh, entrepreneurs to uh, be kept in mind before they uh, embark on the fundraising exercise. One of the things is, uh, when And this is a different definition because uh, if you're too late in the exercise, then you run the risk of burning out. If you're too early in the exercise, you run the risk of uh, lower valuation. Uh, well, valuation again, uh, like I just was saying, is very hypothetical. Yet at the same time, if you are, the, you know, the longer you are running your business, the more likely that you know, uh, you are reaching revenues and uh, your investors seeing uh, your potential investors are seeing some. So to that extent it is, uh, but of course it is, as a general rule of thumb, it's always better to uh, uh, push as, uh, you know, for as later as possible. But at the same time, we need to keep fundraising timelines in mind. And I know a lot of uh, entrepreneurs who say, we got a term sheet, you know, as if it's the end of the uh, journey, you know, we got a term sheet, but somebody is willing to invest, yes, somebody is willing to invest, but that's, that's just the beginning. The willing to invest to invest is just the beginning. So uh, that is how that, and that's when uh, a lot of entrepreneurs really, really uh, underestimate it. Once they get the term sheet, they think of what is the money, money is going to be the right 
Mm -hmm. More often than not, that's where the journey starts. And many times it just you know it doesn't even work. It has a lot to do with the fact that they're not uh, Then they have to start understanding what it goes with the team, start understanding the investor, whether whether they invest in something positive, whether they invest in something they can appreciate. For. And then like we said, yes, just to do in fact, you, uh, you should push it. And all this is like that timeline which you're talking about six months to nine months is extremely uh, something that you should keep in mind. Mm -hmm. So, uh, prior to setting up impact of engines, I've worked on the other side of the world with a VC fund as well uh, in house. So, I've got to see that aspect very, very closely in house. And now that I've been an entrepreneur myself, and I do end up representing a significant majority of impact investors, I've been entrepreneurs. It's been a very interesting learning curve. So I thought let me share a couple of my insights. Rule number one: never run out of cash. <laughs> the reason why I'm giving that advice: never run out of and cash. <laughs> yeah, common sense is not so common. <laughs> the reason why I'm sharing that pearl of wisdom about never running out of cash is because you are, if you are running out of cash. But if your operations are about to go into financial deal split, if the investor's money does not hit your bank account, trust me, you're already sacrificing half of your negotiating power, whatever that may be, uh, that you have with the investor, right? So the board of directors will say not be less than this or more than this. They will also say, as a measure of good corporate governance, that independent directors uh, may be appointed collectively by the board as a whole, because independent directors, especially if they're sector experts, bring a lot of value to the business, right? They will put in a lot of governance rights, uh, which is good corporate governance, saying that you will mandatorily hold four board meetings in a year, which incidentally for a lot of uh, the uninitiated in the audience is also a requirement under the Indian Companies Act in India. They will also say that when you're holding the board meeting, please send us the materials for the board meeting 21 days in advance. What also ends up happening in board meetings is sometimes it's just a suggestion of a giant samosa, and everybody goes back to doing their own work. And the minutes just simply say that the chairman was appointed, quorum was established, everyone countries, which if they choose to exercise a vote, the entire UN Security Council cannot take any action on it. That right that we would have learnt in civics or political science in school is known as veto right. Pretty much the same right the VC has learned from the United Nations Security Council. And they prescribe a laundry list, as Bruce chose to very eloquently put it, of certain reserved matters in the uh, shareholders agreement without which if unless you don't have an affirmative right uh, affirmative vote from the investor you cannot go for now the thing to watch out for for the investors in that kind of a conversation is that you don't want an investor who is micromanaging the affairs of the company the idea is not to hinder the everyday running of the company that for every breath you take you've got to take the uh, consent of the investor the idea is to have a relatively pared down strategic and operational items and how you choose to fight that battle is up your alleyway. Right? Uh, Bruce also mentioned about information rights because if I'm a shareholder, I've got to have information and keep my pulse, not only on financial metrics or social. Right? So Has, I want to come to you about exit because uh, that is something that, uh, should we? Yeah. I well, no, I, was gonna say, I mean, uh, should we talk about any protections for entrepreneurs? I think are there, are there protections for entrepreneurs in these documents? Sure. So, uh, you want to talk about exit and entrepreneur protection and we throw the full open for the audience then? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, first I'll come to uh, uh, lock-in investing because this is something I think uh, uh, kind of hits uh, entrepreneurs, it blindsides entrepreneurs when we see this in the document. A lot of them lose their heads because in India, many entrepreneurs are very emotional about their businesses and their ownership of it. Uh, but one of the things that happens in any uh, investment transaction is that, uh, again, again, this is one of the fundamental principles, is that the investor is investing in you and uh, not your company or your business model or your idea. So to a large extent, he's investing in you and he would like you to be committed to the company. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, there is a lock-in on your shares and you're, uh, you're uh, stopped from selling your shares for a certain period of time where the investor feels that you should be committed to the company. And there's also something called vesting, which says that you will earn your shares over a period of time after I've invested in your company. Uh, and this will be proportional over a period of time. So if uh, you leave after one out of four years that I expect you to stay in the company, then 
uh, you can only keep 25 percent of the shares that you uh, hold and you know the rest should come back to the company to be issued to a new CEO. So, uh, so, so it is sort of, uh, well it, it, it could be called, uh, sweat, it, it would be called sweat equity in general parlance but reverse vesting basically what it does is it, uh, the understanding is that the promoter is earning his equity over a period of time and he should lose it if he is not uh, continuing with the company. Uh, promoter protections, uh, well, like I said, uh, the <coughs> principle is that uh, the shareholders agreement is being entered into only because, uh, only from an investor uh, perspective of protecting the investor's rights. Uh, there's not really much that the entrepreneur is trying to protect because the entrepreneur is getting the money. So even, even if it is debt, even if you are borrowing money from a bank, you will see every term in the loan agreement is... Uh, you know, the lender is, you know, lender, uh, one, you know, requires this right or requires you to do this or requires you to do that. Because once the money has hit your account, like Pankaj likes to say, you are wearing the pants and not the other side. Which is why the documentation is very lopsided in favor of the investors. Um, so what, what about, I guess, uh, Sorry. I, I guess, why, you know, again, because there are these situations, if you end up in a situation where you have a board that's either controlled by the investors or maybe it's balanced in the sense you have an equal number of on, uh, entrepreneur nominees and an equal number of investor uh, nominees and an independent director, right? Those are situations in which, again, kind of the, the entrepreneur as the CEO or as some other officer could, be, could have their employment terminated. And so at least in the U.S. what we do, and, that, and if I were an entrepreneur, I would, I would never take money from a VC unless I had an employment agreement. Which said, hey, if you know you end up firing, if I get a, end up getting fired for uh, uh, a reason that didn't, that wasn't cause, you know, like if you just end up firing me because you didn't like my cologne or if you didn't, you know, like just whatever, you know, like I want to make sure that I get a severance payment. I want to be compensated for the fact that I'm losing my professional uh, position. So I don't know if that's that, that's standard in India. So yeah. we're making clauses around so firing with cause, without cause. Right. So what are the consequences attaching to that? So the employment agreement, I think, is, is very important because that does, again, that, that does protect against a situation where yeah. you you kind of lose control of the board, and there's a, there's a situation where you can be fired as the executive. Yeah. And if that were to happen, you want to make sure that you're you're getting paid out. And uh, what's happening to your pro uh, equity as well post firing? So that is an equally important conversation. Right. A couple of other, in fact, promoter protections on that note before we quickly throw open the floor for uh, audience questions is, for instance, a lot of promoters say that we want a prohibition on sale to competitors of the company for X number of years or in perpetuity. Because we've, uh, we've seen very interesting permutations and combinations of that prohibition on sale where one entrepreneur actually uh, did not get along with his immediate family members. Uh, and extended family members. So we went to the pain of putting down close to about 48 names in the schedule that at no point of time can the investors sell shares to such and such individuals and their affiliate companies. Uh, a lot of promoters are also very, very uh, uh, KG about competitors getting backdoor entry into the company, right, as shareholders. So they actually say you will not sell to a competitor, but the definition of competitor is very important. Some of the entrepreneurs also choose to put down the names of their competitors and cap it off with a generic statement or any of their affiliates, right? Uh, uh, it may be time qualified, it may not be time qualified. A lot of investors push back saying that, look, if I'm exceeding my investment horizon, there is no way I'm going to handicap uh, myself by saying I'm not going to sell to your uh, competitor in period, right? Because you've got a contractual commitment to honor anyways uh, to give me exit. And, uh, with all said and done, in our experience and opinion, exit has been a kind of oxymoron in the social impact investing space. There are not many exit stories to write home about, except probably the downside exit where the company shut shop, right? And everybody went home without any money. So uh, some of the protections that we recommend is say uh, prohibition on sale to competitors, firing with or without cause and having a watertight employment contract, or even saying that when the transfer of shares is happening by the investor, at least a curtsy right of first offer is being extended to the promoter. So at least the promoter knows that uh, that exit is happening, the investor is looking to sell, and it's a very benign right that in our experience, most of the sophisticated investors typically concede to. Right. The other thing is also on your personal liabilities and your personal obligations that many, in fact, a lot of negotiations get stuck on that because uh, investors sometimes require uh, a certain level of personal commitment in the sense of you having to bring your resources into the contract. Uh, and and in, in the social impact, uh, in the impact sector, 
uh, one of the issues, like I was mentioning, when uh, the investment does not fit the charter of the investor, and the investor will then uh, want to have something in the contract that says that uh, we can sell to you if your business moves away from the uh, from from our uh, uh, from the principles that we have outlined for investments. Uh, and this can be very dicey because the promoters may or may not have the resources to buy the investors out, and it is an obligation of the promoters. And any other obligation, any indemnity, anything which uh, requires the promoter to bring in money at a future point of time can be dicey, uh, is negotiated, settled in different ways depending on the transaction. So I think that is one very important uh, Excellent point. Yeah. Yeah. And on that note, the floor is now all yours. Would love to hear questions, uh, experiences, anecdotes. <coughs> Let's start with the gentleman up front. I've been hearing about, uh, I, I suppose all three of you are lawyers. We are all three partners as well. Partners as well, <laughs> okay. But uh, I have raised uh, money up to 10 crores in uh, equity and uh, uh, debt uh, from uh, uh, financial institutions. As of now, I have not uh, hired a lawyer. I have not heard about uh, what you guys have uh, talked about. One banker once told me that uh, once he started uh, reading the agreement. He says, if you read the agreement, you will never sign it. So just sign it. And <laughs> That's why you never heard of it, because you are a classic capital for the entrepreneur we were talking about. We are, we are always <laughs> running after the capital. We are yeah. always sure yeah. of yeah. ourselves yeah. that we will always do well. We have yes. Caught up that's, that's an excellent point and I want to emphasize the practical learning we've uh, 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 seen in the case. You know, as lawyers, our experience always has been that when the skies are blue, your agreement is in the drawer gathering dust. It's when the skies are stormy that the agreement comes out and that's when the fine print gets dissected. So you've also been in the fortunate position that A, uh, your banker was wise enough to tell you at that point of time the wisdom is up for grabs there, uh, that don't need the fine print otherwise you will never sign and raise funding and hence you have never heard of those terms. I can pretty much promise you if you raise funding from a sophisticated VC investor, at least 90% of the terms that we have mentioned on this uh, course of our discussion of the last couple of minutes, if not 100% and more, will definitely be there in the deal documentation. And yours is also a classic case why we have the popular English uh, adage, ignorance is bliss, right? So you are undoubtedly very blissful about not having read the document uh, so far. And of course, if the skies have been blue, that's why neither as an investor, neither have you gone back to that documentation to figure out what happens next. Another thing is that uh, the, the judiciary, the law itself is such yep. a slow process. Right. I'm, if I'm not I've gone wrong, yeah. I, I surely know that for 10 years nothing is going to happen. Absolutely. <laughs> and that is the <laughs> thing. Is that, that is the reality of life. And That's true. I am sure 99% of the entrepreneurs have the same thing. Exactly. Even the investor has the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> because as we, are, we represent both sides of the wall and more predominantly investors than entrepreneurs. So when we are asked to give a binding opinion to the investor, about the enforceability of the agreement under Indian law and what happens when, as we like to say, shit hits the fan. Our disclaimer section is far more longer than the actual substantive piece of the advice, right? So we say that Indian courts are plagued with delays. The enforceability of clauses like liquidation preference or lock-in is a proposition which is not free from doubt. Uh, the enforceability of put option may be subject to, uh, all of these exit rights may be subject to interference by the Reserve Bank of India or the central government. India changes its law at least twice a year, <laughs> right? So that's that's a charm of doing business in an emerging market economy. But I'll tell you what's a softer piece there. The softer piece there is, if an entrepreneur chooses to screw over an investor, right? The reputation is pretty much already uh, destroyed in the market, right? And it's a small ecosystem. Exactly. Correct. Exactly. So that's the point. Agreements are not only for legal protection. No, no, absolutely, but agreements are, are not necessarily for legal protection. Agreements are also an aid against amnesia and optional interpretation of what was a commercial understanding. More often than not, when you're raising money from a fund, trust me, 95% of the times the investment manager who led the deal at the time of investment would not be around at the time when exit is happening or you're looking to engage in some level of other tactical thing. Because that fund relationship manager at that point of time probably would have moved on to set up his or her own fund, <laughs> reality of life. 
typically would have moved on to be an investment manager in some other fund. Again, reality of life. And you've got to uh, deal with some other guy or uh, a person who's come into the fund, right? So it's more an aid uh, not only against legal battles, it's more also a protection against amnesia or people moving on. The consequences, I mean, it's, you know, it's very, if I think about my career, the, the number of times actually my the documents that I've produced for a deal, the number of times it has it been litigated or subject to a commercial dispute, very, very small percentage, yeah. Yeah. you know, 1%. You know. So, so, but when it happens, it really sucks. Yes. And, and, you know, and if you don't understand your rights, you can really get screwed. So it's the kind of thing. And then, so I guess, you know, you have to think, and it's a little bit different in India, because in the U.S., there's no question about whether you hire a lawyer and have someone look at the documents, you know, and, and um, but I think you have to kind of think about what's the transaction cost to have Pankaj and Suhas look at your documents, you know, it's probably relatively low if you consider kind of some of the bad stuff that can happen if the deal goes wrong. And again, it's not just, and it's not just in the kind of litigation context, like what if, what if you have terms in there that impact your ability to exit or your payout and exit or terms in there that you know restrict your shares or give them some ability to purchase your shares at a discount. You know, so there's ways you can get economically screwed that have nothing to do with with whether the documents are ever litigated in court. So another thing is that uh, even if it is you're going on to the downside, the investor is also not trying to impose because he's also hoping that you do good and the money will come out of it. That's a blue sky scenario. It's yeah. like uh, it just remains as a document. I mean, because the investor also is not really want to uh, impose all the conditions that if they impose the condition, the business is going to go bad in any right. case. Yeah. So he's always always the hoping that the other guy is also. Right. The document just remains as a document. All, it also depends a lot on your relationship with the investor, which Correct. goes up and down. And yes. every time it goes down, they come to us. What can we do to this guy? And then or maybe, or maybe the investor, or maybe the investor changes because the investors always, almost always have the right to freely transfer their shares. True. Right. And so you don't know if seven years from now you're dealing with the same investor. The and you don't even know if you're dealing with the lost. same, the same person, with the same investor. Right. Yeah. I mean, the guy that you really trust and like and. You know, he's gone, and it's, anyway, so it's, I mean, we're obviously biased as we're lawyers, and we make a living doing this, but. <laughs> <laughs> you had a question. Yes. Uh, in India, a uh, few foreign investing companies are coming forward to uh, invest in Indian companies. Right. Right. Indian companies. So, uh, the option is, in a, like that foreign company with 20% collateral and 3% foreign currency interest rate, right. they are coming forward to invest and uh, uh, these banks with 20% collateral and 13% interest, they are coming forward to invest. Sure. According to Indian law, which is a better option to do? I don't think it's necessarily a law option, it's more an economics option for you. You've got to look at the cash outflow and just to be for the benefit of everyone on the audience, you're talking about debt, you're not talking about equity. Right? So, uh, so essentially what the gentleman here has asked a question, as an entrepreneur, if you're looking to raise foreign debt capital, which comes at a far lesser interest rate because fortunately the Reserve Bank of India imposes a very low ceiling on the interest rate which is charged on foreign debt as opposed to the uh, interest rate which is charged on domestic debt capital by Indian scheduled banks, right? And that is your question. Uh, first and foremost, doing foreign debt capital in Indian investing companies is a path of extreme high resistance. There is only a very, very limited portion that in our experience on a business side that Indian early stage enterprises can tap into foreign debt capital because there is a clear prohibition on using debt capital for working capital purposes. And that out, at, by its very nature disqualifies most of the early stage businesses because primarily they are looking for working capital to scale up their business. right? And the number of hoops you have to jump through to get or to be eligible for that because every financing transaction all said and done is a function of two things. One is ability to give and second is ability to receive. And India has very onerous thresholds that it, it imposes on ability of foreign lenders to give and ability of Indian borrowers to receive that capital. I'm not a huge fan of the debt route at all, but if you manage to meet those onerous sniff tests, all power to you. We had a question somewhere there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so um, during this discussion, you painted a picture where it's the investor, you know, versus the entrepreneur. But in thinking about, you know, how in creating an environment, like a more amiable environment, um, 
you know, lead throughout the evaluation process, um, you know, looking at the term sheet and then negotiating. Are there any like best practices that you would recommend, such as, you know, maybe having an open book policy while creating the evaluation model, or you know, how can you just make that whole experience a lot more friendly and not so much, you know, kind of two sides pitted against each other? Excellent question. Yeah, and I, I, I that is a, a good question. Again, we talked about a really, you know, you know Viewing it as, as a partnership, knowing that you're going to be having an extended relationship with this person. Right, so you want it. And this is kind of tough. It's like doing a, a prenuptial. I just got engaged a couple weeks ago, and I, you know, I actually did think, like, well, should I do a, like, have this prenuptial conversation? And I actually decided not to. So I said, you know what, I don't, it just doesn't, it's not the way I want to start my relationship, kind of talking about what happens when everything goes wrong, right? And, um, but it's, you know, in this context, it's something that you have to do. And I think it's, it's something that's sort of like, you know, haggling here when you're, when you're negotiating to buy something in the market. I mean, I think, and it's, I understand it less, but it seems the Indians understand, like, this isn't really a conflict. This is just part of how the process works, right? It doesn't mean that you're a bad guy because you're asking for a higher price, or I'm one because I'm asking for a lower price. It's just part of the process. And, you know, we can do it with a smile. And I think, so I, I think it's, you know, having an understanding of, look, this is, to some extent, a necessary evil. You know, we need to put together these legal documents. We need to agree on these terms, right? But it doesn't mean we're in a conflict situation. And, and we're, what we're really uh, hoping to do is to get to something that's fair and works for all parties. And then I, you know, so in terms of approach, like what I tell both my investor and my entrepreneur clients is, you know, start somewhere closer to the middle. I mean, don't, you know, don't take the approach of, I'm the investor, I'm going to, you know, provide the most onerous terms and then, you know, see to what extent they're negotiated back. Get something closer to the middle where you think you would end up in anyway after the lawyers have talked to each other a dozen times, right? And, and, um, and same thing with the, with the entrepreneur. Again, you know, lead with something that's, that's more, that's my personal approach, lead with something that's more towards, towards the middle and which is fair. And, you know, I think on the transparency, I've actually, um, I would like to see more of that. I mean, I've, I thought of the idea of do we really even really need to have two sets of lawyers on the deal? I mean, why can't it be sort of looking at the lawyer as, a, uh, as an enabler or a facilitator where there's agreement on the business terms and you just ask the lawyer, put together something fair, you know, and then if there's questions about it, answer those questions transparently and discuss the consequences to both the investor and the entrepreneur. Again, because the idea is we're all in this together, we all have the same objectives of making some money and making some impact, but, you know. We haven't gotten there. I haven't really found anyone take, uh, willing to take me up on that offer. You know, um, people still seem to want to have their their advocates to some extent, the person on their side, and they seem to want to be in, involved in this uh, negotiation process. But but again, I think the important thing is just to remember and reinforce this with the investor. Hey, I'm really looking forward to this long-term relationship. I want it. You know, I want to be married to you. This is just a part of the process, and let's hang in there, and, and we'll go out and we'll you know doesn't let's you know, then celebrate afterwards with a dinner or a drink and remind ourselves that we're, that we're friends. Yeah, my personal insight to your uh, uh, very insightful question is uh, uh, typically promoters, because they're so passionate and possessive of the business model, sometimes tend to forget at the time of negotiation that it's only beginning of a long <coughs> journey in the relationship. And they actually just look at it as a personal affront on every point. Please bear in mind this is beginning of a relationship which everyone hopes is an amicable relationship, right? So from a negotiation standpoint, please be very tactical about the battles you choose to fight. Get a lot of outside in perspective because when you're in the heat of things, when you're in the heat of negotiation, it is very difficult to lose sight of the bigger goal, right? Often it ends up becoming an ego battle. What we typically always recommend clients is the classic Harvard textbook strategy of good cop, bad cop. <coughs> Right? Have a good cop on a negotiation and a bad cop. Typically, the promoter, as a general rule of the thumb, should always end up playing good cop. That's true. The other advantage of hiring lawyers is right? yeah. you can blame it on somebody else. Exactly. Because because of, lawyers, it's not me. Yeah, because the <laughs> lawyer doesn't have to maintain a long term relationship with the investor, as a general rule of the thumb. Right? Second and more important thing, another interesting tactic is if you're fortunate enough to have a co founder, have one co founder play good cop, another co founder play bad cop. Right? Works like a charm. And if any of you choose to do that opposite me, I'll see through it. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> the, another additional strategy that uh, we recommend typically is, uh, which we saw in a recent investment deal to a lot of success, is promoter already had the foresight to build a very powerful board, board of directors. Okay, and they were using a Series B, 
and the chairperson of the board was a non-executive chairperson, a very seasoned industry veteran, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, who brought down a lot of sense and sensibility in terms of how negotiations ended up happening between the entrepreneur and the investor. And the investor actually respected that, right? The investor was very, very happy to respect the seniority and the wisdom that the powerful chairperson of the board brought. And the powerful chairperson only wasn't peering towards a promoter. That chairperson was a very powerful sheet anchor in the conversation in ensuring that the uh, best interests of the company are always uh, uh, protected, right? Uh, the promoter is not going on a right of uh, his own in terms of saying, hey, this is not acceptable. Uh, yet at the same time, investor is not walking away with unreasonable terms. Right? Uh, the relationship first is a key ingredient in always building a strong uh, uh, conversation with the investor. And I don't, I was gonna say, I don't want us to sound like we're investor bashing. I mean, because you know, investors are really nice people as well. Yeah. You know, and frankly, especially like in the. Right? Yeah, he's like, yeah. But you know, it's, <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know and I, I've, I've found, find, frankly, particularly in kind of the impact or social enterprise space, that I mean, their, their motive often is, is they want to see good things happen in the world with your company. And, and, and they also want you to see, see you grow as, as individuals and flourish. So, um, you know, that's sometimes important to remember, too, because if they end up, if you feel like the investor is demanding some, some term that to you seems unreasonable, it's sometimes important to think, Hey, I know this person isn't really evil, right? Maybe like, there's a story behind it that I don't understand. Maybe I need to understand more about why they're asking for this term. And any sound relationship is always built when the other party doesn't feel screwed over. That's very, very important, right? So no matter how watertight contracts you make in, no matter how much negotiations you do, if at the end of the day when the contract has been signed, executed, and money has hit the bank account, and if the other party feels screwed over, trust me, that is something which you can never undo. Yes. I just have a basic question. Um, when you talk about negotiation and starting closer to the middle, what do you find usually happens on the other side? Because I, I'm not that fancy in negotiation, but my understanding is you're always trying to, you know, ask for as much as you think you can possibly, and then you know you're going to get cut down. So if you start in the middle, isn't there that risk? So it, it, it might be different in India. I mean, but in the in the U.S. there's a, there's not a lot of variance in, in some of these terms in the U.S. And there's, and it's, and, what we moved to in the U.S. is sort of, this is kind of the standard approach. A lot of deals have been done in the U.S. in the venture capital world. So there's a lot of understanding about what makes sense and what is reasonably fair for both sides. So there's a real sense of like, why well, spend a lot of time and money fighting about this stuff, right? Because if you're dealing with sophisticated lawyers, they're going to end up negotiating you back to this center point anyway. So, so that's why, you know, again, at least in the U.S. context, it could be, di could be different here. I don't, I don't know, but in the U.S. context, uh, you know, if you're dealing with U.S. investors, I mean, they're going to appreciate that you're starting in the middle because that means you don't have to, you're not spending the, the time and the cycles on revising documents, you know, unnecessarily. And, and, and they won't beat you up about it. If you offer something that's fair and that is standard, they will accept it. And what it means is you get through your documents in one, uh, one turn or two turns instead of five. So a lot of sophisticated investors, including the gentleman who's sitting in the back uh, uh, from Unitas, they have standard deal terms, right? Sri Krishna, you want to talk about and what's your perception on entrepreneurs when they push back on terms which are not standard and how do you deal with that situation? Sure. So I think one of the things sometimes uh, one does realize is that... Um, sorry. sorry. Sure. Thanks. Uh, and, and just, just I guess, uh, from, uh, from having done, uh, done investments, uh, sometimes, you know, I think something that's very helpful is for the on, you know, for the entrepreneur to articulate, hey, I'd like to really understand why this term is is yeah. so important to you, True. right? And that's when you're having when you have a conversation about it. Uh, there are many times when, as an investor, you're willing to give that up because you realize that you know what was applicable for for uh, an earlier investment may not actually uh, apply. So you know, while we all we try and ensure that you know you're, you're working with standard term sheets. Um, there could be times where you know a particular thing is not is not relevant for for an entrepreneur or for an investor, and and if that question is asked as to hey can you help me understand why this term is so important to you as an investor, uh, you could actually then you, you do see a situation where uh, you know you're willing to give up on that term because you also realize from the other side that you know there's a reason why the entrepreneur is asking you to give that up. So I think that would be I guess one thing. Um, I think the other thing is also, you know, like like Pankaj uh, mentioned, 
you know, the way we look at all of these, uh, the way we look at investment, uh, you know, uh, agreements and all of this is, you're really just protecting uh, against what could be uh, a downside and, and, and stormy weather. Uh, and I think uh, one of the things I found uh, helps us is ensuring that that's the message that you're getting across to the to the entrepreneur right at the start of the conversation. That look, you know, when things are all going well, you're not really going to you know look at this. Uh, but it's it's just really about protecting yourself for for a time, not just the investor, but also the uh, also the entrepreneur for for a situation where you know things uh, things go south. Uh, I think that's probably the other uh, insight. Yeah. That's a final question, and I do realize I'm keeping a lot of folks here from lunch. Uh, <coughs> actually, my question, uh, if you don't have to take take on some really good point from this particular conversation. So, uh, as it comes to the FDI investments are concerned. From uh, from the investor perspective, the investors is from a uh, uh, foreign Europe, European country. So uh, and then we will have to, as according to the middle path that that uh, uh, sort of mentioned, before we take that middle path. So uh, what are the legal implications that are involved as 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 according to uh, the drafting terms first and secondly, wherein should the legal as well as the investment banker should be involved in this particular board game? Excellent point. So I'll answer that. Uh, <coughs> two levels and before uh, I also throw it open to them. Typically, uh, I'll answer your second part first. Getting an investment banker is only recommended where you don't have the wherewithal to write your own business plan or figure out the basics of the process or you are not well connected enough to investors to directly reach out to them. In our experience, a lot of uh, sophisticated investors actually do not like seeing investment bankers on the deal. Just like they do not also like seeing lawyers on the other side, it just means the entire process painful. Uh, no disrespect to my fellow brethren, uh, but uh, fundamentally as an investment banker, a lot of investors tell you that, hey, I would prefer not to have I bank on the deal because ultimately 1-2% to of the deal size is just going in the I banker's pocket here, which is precious growth money for the company, right? So A, ascertain whether you're sophisticated enough to write your own business plan, articulate it, reach out to investors on your own, because ultimately sophisticated investors don't prefer seeing I bankers on the deal. And I'm seeing both for commercial investors as well as impact investors, right? The second aspect is getting a lawyer involved is primarily, uh, we always advise that get an overview of the exercise, but definitely do not sign off on a term sheet until it has been vetted by professional eyes. Because term sheet typically is the first stage which wherein you are getting a picture of what are the key legal terms and commercial terms. Because corporate lawyers typically advise you not only on legalities as well, but because there's a thin line between what's legal and commercial, right? So sound business lawyers or corporate lawyers will advise you by providing legal advice balanced with business prudence and pragmatism, right? And that's why they're called corporate lawyers, right? So get, definitely engage with them the moment you are uh, on the verge of uh, re uh, raising funds. Talk to them about the entire process, what we've described to you. Get your housekeeping in order. One of the things that a lot of entrepreneurs fail to do is get their corporate housekeeping, like <coughs> your minutes register, your legal compliances, your statutory registers, which are required to impose in India, uh, have in place in India in place. Uh, with benign intent, of course, we're not saying it's with malign intent because as a startup order, we have anyways got 123 things which are keeping you awake. Your corporate housekeeping in order because in our experience, good corporate governance actually drives up valuation. The investor has comfort knowing that they are investing in a clean company. If it's got a robust working board, which is already staffed with independent directors, your compliances are flawless, there are no skeletons in the closet popping out the moment you're embarking on the uh, investment exercise, it will help you drive up valuation, it will help you uh, command a lot of respect from the investor as well and hopefully convert and close the exercise quickly. Right? So get your uh, lawyers, accountants, company secretaries involved in advance that there are no skeletons in the closet. And of course, don't sign off any documents without review. That's, that's a candidate advice. Uh, your first and second aspect about, you have to keep in mind when you are talking about a European investor, it's what we said earlier, either you raise equity or compulsory convertible prep share or a compulsory convertible debenture. And I'm sure these folks so offline will help you on that. Yeah, we should, we should wrap up, so. Yes, we should wrap up. Thank you so much for being such a patient uh, audience, especially in the freelance session. I personally enjoy this. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Yeah. Sure, you guys don't do right? Definitely. Yeah. So what generally what kind of equities do you think?